the de Havilland Mosquito. I was absolutely fascinated with this aircraft growing up. It was the wooden marvel. It couldn't be caught by anyone, so I thought. It was often the subject of the stories that my elderly neighbour used to tell me. In his tales, the Mosquito was always disrupting speeches by high-ranking Nazi leaders and dropping their bombs bang on target. It made me think for a long time that the Mosquito and the RF crews that operated her were infallible. But of course, that's not the case. And on the 21st of March 1945, the Mosquito, although famed, was in the midst of controversy. I'm talking about Operation Carthage, which left 87 Danish school children dead at the hands of the men trying to liberate them. Most of us are familiar with the French resistance, but in fact, resistance movements in German occupation sprung up all over Europe, and even in Germany herself. Denmark was no exception. The Danes had been invaded as part of Operation Visa Rubung sued by Germany on the 9th of April 1940, in an operation which would also occupy Norway. Despite fighting valiantly, though hamstrung by their own governments, Danish forces were forced to capitulate after just six hours. The invasion came in spite of a non-aggression pact signed between the two nations less than a year earlier. As could be imagined, the Danish people were not pleased to be under the yoke of German oppression, and many of them decided to fight back. By 1945, members of the Danish resistance numbered well over 20,000, and they were very active, hampering German efforts. As Denmark was the site of important defences against Allied bombing of the Reich, this would not be tolerated. This resulted in a massive crackdown on the organisation by the feared Gestapo. A huge database of information had been gathered at Gestapo headquarters in Copenhagen, a place known as Shell House at the heart of the city. With their organisation under threat, and near to total exposure, Danish resistance leaders begged the British to take out the German headquarters. It was a tall order. The Shell House stood at the middle of a European capital which was densely populated. Not only would there be a high risk of civilian casualties, but also the death of many resistance fighters themselves. Ruthlessly, the Gestapo employed the very people the British would be trying to save as human shields by locking Danish resistance fighters in the upper floors of the Shell House. This meant that no attack could come from above without killing the 30 or so freedom fighters within. The only option would be to target the lower floors of the building where the Gestapo worked and kept their records. Enter the Mosquito. While the average heavy bomber may not have been able to hit a single building in the middle of a city, the twin-engine Mosquito had demonstrated its ability to do just that. Less than a year previously, as part of Operation Jericho, the Mosquito had punched a hole through the side of a prison in France, allowing many resistance fighters to escape. Could it be done in Denmark? Initially, the British had thought no. But after further examination of photographs and maps, an approach was found from the southwest, which would give the mozzies just enough time to line up. So after several months of planning, the raid, dubbed Operation Carthage, was launched on the morning of the 21st of March 1945. The force attacking the shell house would consist of 20 mosquitoes from the RAF 2nd Tactical Air Force, Taking off from RAF First Field in Norfolk were six Mark VI Mosquitoes from 21 Squadron, with another six from 464 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force, and 487 Squadron, Royal New Zealand Air Force, respectively. Joining them would be another two mozzies from the Photo Reconnaissance Unit, with the task of collecting footage for analysis and propaganda. To help protect the bomber force and to suppress ACAC units over the target were 30 Mustang Mark III's from 64 and 126 Squadron REF. As the force set out a wave top height across the North Sea, the first in a series of mishaps occurred when three Mustangs were obliged to abort after flying through a flock of seagulls, resulting in multiple bird strikes. It was not to be the last collision of the sortie the attacking mosquitoes would be split into three waves, each targeting the shell house. This was likely because each mosquito carried delayed action bomb fuses and the trailing aircraft would have been hit if all 20 mozzies attacked together. 
It also helped to avoid an entire bombing force from dropping their payload on the wrong target. Lining up for the bomb run, the first wave of six number 21 squadron mosquitoes and one of the PRU mozzies started a series of events which would result in a disaster for hundreds of families in Copenhagen that day. Passing the train station on the approach, Mosquito Sierra Zulu 977, T for Tommy, with pilot Wing Commander Glebo and Canadian Navigator Flight Officer Hall hit a 30 meter lamppost. Losing control, Glenbow's aircraft headed north in the left bank before hitting the roof of number 106 Sonder Boulevard. As the plane's wings disintegrated, the bombs ripped off the machine and exploded, killing 12 people. The aircraft eventually crashed seconds later in a garage near the French language Jean d'Arc Catholic School at Friedrichsburg Alley. The two crew members were both killed, and their deaths would unfortunately mean further loss of life that day. If you think this is a story worth spreading, then please do give the video a like because it really helps YouTube to keep stories like this alive. Now, let's get back to the story. Oblivious to the loss of this mosquito, the other 521 Squadron aircraft had successfully identified and bombed the Gestapo headquarters, leaving the building burning. This had been achieved by swooping low over a body of water, the Santo Jordan so, which gave a perfect skip bombing approach to the target. Approaching from any other direction would not allow for a successful attack. As the second wave sped over the Copenhagen rooftops from the west, the burning wreck from Sierra Zulu 977 obscured the target a few kilometers further east. Rightly confused, the entire second wave almost bombed the crash site by mistake. But when Commander Iredell realized the mistake and turned towards the actual target, a few blocks away. Nevertheless, for whatever reason, two mosquitoes dropped their bombs, hitting the Jean d'Arc school. This was when the true disaster of Operation Carthage really began. As the third wave flew low over the city, the growing smoke from the school appeared to be their intended target, and all six mosquitoes dropped their payload. The mistake led to the death of 86 children and 16 adults out of 482 children and adults on campus that morning. A further 67 children and 35 adults were wounded. The Gestapo headquarters was successfully destroyed and 18 out of the 26 prisoners held in the building survived. In a message broadcasted later, the Danish resistance thanked the RAF for successfully destroying the intelligence gathered by the German secret police. The RAF crews did not come away from this sortie unscathed. In addition to the loss of Sierra Zulu 977, which led to the disaster, another three mozzies would crash before reaching home, and two Mustangs were also lost. A total of nine airmen died on the Allied side. So why did the wonder weapon I loved so much as a little boy lead to such a massive loss of innocent lives in this raid? The simple fact is that trying to hit such a small target among such a built-up area was a tall order. The aircrew in 1945 had to rely on basic navigation instruments and the most fallible of technology, the Mark I eyeball. I've flown a lot in light civilian aircraft at fairly low altitude, and it's hard even when you're flying that slowly to identify whole towns in unfamiliar areas. Doing that at a couple hundred miles an hour and on the deck would be a real challenge. The navigators would have been relying on a simple compass bearing and a stopwatch in order to line their pilots up for the attack. Landmarks may have been rushing by so quickly they were impossible to rely on. So looking at the approach, the key factor is that the true target was beside water, while the school was next to parkland. Easy to spot now from the comfort of my office, at those speeds, one burning building would have appeared much the same as another. Taking another pass would have been almost suicidal, even with the 27 Mustangs suppressing the anti-aircraft fire during the raid. Ultimately, Operation Carthage is one of the many successful raids that the British launched against specific targets during the war. The collateral damage was accepted at the time and has subsequently been memorialised by the Danish. Both the Shell House and the Jean d'Arc School are no longer features of the Copenhagen landscape. In their place are a statue remembering the civilians who died, especially the children, and a memorial 
also to the dead. If you want to know more, I can recommend a film on Netflix which shows the Danish perspective of this raid. It's called The Bombardment in English. Be prepared for Danish with English subtitles and even some familiar faces. It's actually what reminded me about this story. So if you've enjoyed the video, then please consider giving it a like to help it spread to more people. And if you want to learn a little bit more about the RAF during World War II, then do check out the video on screen right now. See you guys later.